this week on Dig Me Out. With your hosts, Jason Ziak and Tim Minichi. Jay, we're back again with another episode thanks to our Dig Me Out Union at Patreon. You, our listener, can help us make the next episode happen by joining at patreon.com forward slash dig me out. Joining at the $2 level gets you a sticker, and then it goes up from there. You can vote in polls. You can join us at... Uh, various levels to get t-shirts and become a part of our board of directors and you get to vote on these uh the episode we're about to do exactly this is our january poll jay first you get one to decide mm-hmm. one of 60 votes anyone can submit a suggestion over at digmeoutpodcast.com that's how it works you go there you put in an album you say i want you to check this out here's why or you can mysteriously not fill that out such as the case with this <laughs> record that won. Yeah. And uh, we'll just have to guess why you picked it. And then uh, we put it in the uh, the hopper, spits out a poll, and our patrons vote on it. And they had a doozy of a time. This was a close poll, back and forth. Lots of, uh, lots of votes all around. This might have been our most participated poll from what I've seen. In terms of the number of votes, you know, there was no, there was nothing that got zero or one vote. Everything got, you know, at least three votes on this particular poll. So the winner, Jay, drum roll, please. The Breeders' 1990 album, Pod. We are going to be checking that out on this episode. 1990. That, that, that's the uh, one of the years we got to do more of. So yes. this is good. Well, that's clear what our voters thought. They said we have to <laughs> take care of this. Yeah, uh, this uh, this absence of 1990 album reviews. It beats uh, Buffalo Tom Sleepy Eyed by one vote. Correct. See, so if you sign up and get in there, you could be the one vote that makes the uh, get your album reviewed. Yep. Also, very close. Finger Eleven's tip that had six votes, and then there was a tie at five. With Ass Pony's Electric Rock Music and Snow Patrol's Song for Polar Bears. Hagfish, Rock Your Lame Ass. That's right, yes. Got four votes. And then uh, my favorite band of all time. Einstürzende Neubauten. Yeah. <laughs> Tabla Rosa. Tabla Rasa. That had four votes. And then coming in last was Autekers. Try. Repite. Maybe. I don't know. That's how you, I think it's Autecker. Repita. Repita. I think Autecker is how you pronounce the band name. I don't know about the album name. We'll go with that. We'll go with that. I am always going to slaughter any name which is slightly difficult to pronounce. It's part of the fun of listening. It is. It's, this is a tradition going back many, <laughs> many decades on this podcast. Um, so, Jay, who suggested the Breeders' Pod? It was suggested by Brian Zillow or Zylo. Um, Brian did not leave a comment, which is unusual. And I think this is the only record he suggested. But uh, interesting, yeah. Well, he just like went he in, should, should... bought one lottery ticket, and won I the whole know, thing. I know. I was just going to say that. I hope Brian plays the lottery and hits up Vegas a couple times a year because he's a lucky dude. Yeah. Were you familiar with... The, I know you know The Breeders, Jay, but were you familiar with this sure. album? Uh, no, I don't think I ever listened to it. Um, I knew the, you know, the, the album cover's uh, really cool. Um, it's one of those seminal kind of early 90s alternative uh, album covers. So I knew the cover, obviously. I knew Less Splash, um, but no, I had never listened to the record. Just on the album cover, this came out on 4 AD and slash Electra Records. It was actually on a rough trade for a period of time, but then rough trade went bankrupt. So then it was taken over by Electra. Um, 4AD had like an in-house art guy name. Art guy. <laughs> That's a 
an odd way to put it, art design album designer. His name was Vaughn Oliver, and he did mm-hmm. a ton of 4AD album covers. Yeah. So um, there's an interesting little nugget of information. So the photography was done by a guy named Kevin Westerberg. Kevin Westerberg took picture of Vaughn Oliver, who was smitten with Kim Deal at the time, and believed he would appreciate the humor of attaching a belt of dead eels to his underwear, which he intended to resemble phallix. Westerberg used a um, long exposure to achieve a a a blurring effect and then added other visual effects afterward. So what you are seeing are a bunch of dead eels hanging off of a belt. Um, Wow. Yeah. Yeah, no, those 4AD covers are... uh you know, pretty famous within graphic design circles. I always, um, particularly the pixie covers. Yeah. Um, I always thought this was like a sculpture or something that was taken with a, like a macro lens. Cause it, I don't know there's something about it looks, um, maybe because of the blurring, it looks, um, not real. Nope. And I never gave any thought what, the, what those green things were. So they're a belt of eels, which will yeah. be the name of my next band. <laughs> Look for Belt of Eels <laughs> coming. That's a good band name. To, coming to Spotify in 2020. Uh, I was gonna make a Belt of Eels though. Wouldn't you put them around your waist? Well, Is it's it... supposed to represent fertility, and oh. those are supposed to be his manhood. Yeah. Huh? So, right. Yes, we have gone in a very weird direction to start out this podcast. Uh, perhaps what we should do is talk about just briefly who the breeders were at this point. So the breeders actually started as a project for Kim Deal of the Pixies at the time and Tanya Donnelly. They were on tour together in 1988 in Europe and they were, you know, hanging out on tour and having beers and they decided they want to mix music together. And originally it was going to be like more dance oriented music. And then that they scrapped that idea and then they just recorded some demos, and the co-founder of 4AD, whose name is Ivo Watts Russell, um, he heard the demos, and he was like, I want an album. So they ended up going to a studio in Edinburgh, Scotland, with Steve Albini, and over the course of one week, they had scheduled two weeks, but they got it done in one week. They recorded this whole record. So that's the how this came together. Now, it's Josephine Wiggs on bass. And then Britt Walford, who was the drummer in Slint, he plays drums on this band. He was only 19 at the time when he played drums. Uh, but he he goes under the name Shannon Doughton because originally Kim Deal wanted this to be an all-girl band or an all-female band. But they, I guess they had a drummer and it fell through. So Britt came in to play drums and they wanted it to... <laughs> to be a, a, still an all-female band, so they changed his name on the credits. Or he agreed, too. There was also a lot of... I didn't realize this, you know, thinking back. There were a lot of, like, label issues because they were all on different labels. And for them to come together and write songs together and, you know, you had that issue back then. You probably still do now, but it just doesn't happen in the same way. But, you know, Tanya Donnelly was on a different label than... Kim Deal and Kim Deal was on a different label than Britt Walford and Josephine Wiggs was in a different band at the time. I don't know what the band was at the time, but so they actually had to work that out in terms of how they could credit, you know, the different people who played on the on the record. So that was a bit of an issue as well. So and then the other one thing that I wanted to mention as far as Steve Albini, you know, Steve Albini has a very unique way of working. Um He only let them do two takes of anything. And he said, if you don't get it right in two takes, we're not like we're moving on. So they had a lot of fights in the studio because Tanya Donnelly would be like, I want to re-record that guitar part. And he's like, nope, it's fine. Moving on. And she would, they would get into like screaming matches. And Josephine Wiggs, who's the only person who's not an American was like, couldn't understand how they were working. Like, why are you all yelling at each other after every, after you record everything? Mm. She's like, this is this is insane, but it yeah. but it worked out. Let's get into some of the comments, Jay, before we get into this record. Only one person commented that they wanted this record. I know. Isn't that weird? It is weird. Who was that? It, there's not a correlation uh, between what we see in the 
Facebook comments to the Patreon votes to sometimes now the Patreon comments. But uh, Johnny Hooper said, Pod, I just finished writing my best of 2018 list for my site. And I, and wouldn't you know it, the breeders sit at the top of it. Pod is an undisputed gem from top to bottom and a record that firmly established the fruitful working relationship between Steve Albini and Kim Deal. Gotta love the drums of Slint's Brit Walford on this. Yep. So everyone else... Picked talked about a different band. Uh, Jim Lazowski went with Buffalo Tom. Steven Musinski went with Einstürzende Neubauten. Yeah. John Seaman went with Finger Eleven, and Crawford Blair went with Einstürzende Neubauten. Yeah. Whitney Bueller, Hagfish, Christian Wedge, uh, Finger Eleven, Scott Witt. Ass Ponies, Ian Wobble. He didn't really say. Let's mention the Breeders, though. Back in the day, I always found the Breeders, long players, could have always made better EPs in general. Oh, yes, that's right. Yes. Um, Patrick Testa. He mentioned they dug out the Ass Ponies because of this poll. Justin Wexler said he feels like Pod would definitely get featured at some point, and the Hagfish was what he went with. And then... uh, Mike Bond went with Sleepy Eye by Buffalo Tom. Darren Leach just said Ass Ponies, best name on this list. Ha, ha, ha. Eric Peterson went with Tablo Rasa by... Einstürzende Neubauten. Yeah. And uh, that's it, Jay. By the comments, you would think that uh, only, you know, one person voted for Pod and yet it won. So yep. I don't and understand. I, like, I love that the folks are actually digging uh, into the music. They They aren't aware of in these polls right uh like patrick uh listening to ass ponies and for the first time because it appeared in the poll that's awesome um, let us know if you want us to do more of that like make it a either available or we've talked about doing like maybe a little first listens with tim and tim and i so if yeah you guys are into that let us know and we will explore it further definitely all right and of course patreon.com forward slash dig me out that's where you go for these polls and such and whatnot let's get into the record j pod by the breeders tell me one thing you liked about this record i like the dynamics and the overall restraint that's on the guitars i know that sounds weird but it is it's interesting how they play off of each other when the album works really well there's this um, setting up of themes by the drums or the bass or the guitar part but everybody is really well balanced and the drum or the guitars will never while they get you know loud sometimes they it's not for very long you know it'll be for maybe a 10 second span they do these really interesting kind of counters so they'll either pick up a theme or they'll start a theme from something else from another instrument um, or a vocal, or they'll completely counter what's going on. So the bass and the vocal will be locked up and the guitar is doing something totally different. Um, so there's just this really cool dynamic that happens throughout the record with everybody complimenting or contrasting each other. And then the guitars really playing this interesting uh, role where they create tension. Um, they create like big, you know, epic release moments, but it's never overdone like there's this uh this balance that somehow they're able to achieve in terms of uh you never get too much of anything you just get enough of it if you know what i mean like Mm -hmm. you just get a little taste here and there of a part that piques your interest and then it kind of disappears and maybe another instrument picks up the idea but it doesn't no one instrument or no one part dominates which is hard to do with um you know with a rock format that's usually very dependent on loud guitars the loud guitars tend to take over the band and in this case they really don't i mean i don't it's hard to think of an another band or another album that we've reviewed where there's this much balance between all of the different instruments um the drum shine the bass shines both guitar parts shine all the vocals you know have little pieces and parts where they shine so just over all that dynamic and balance is to me what what really stood out is you know pretty remarkable
So, this is going to sound weird what I'm about to say, but what I like about this record and what I don't like about this record are basically the same thing. And what I mean by that is, I like that this record is unconventional in that you listen to this, and if you had listened, like I had, to Kim Deal and the Pixies and songs like Gigantic, you knew that she could write a big hook. And... I came to this backwards, so I didn't get get into the Pixies until after they were done. And I got into the Breeders on Last Splash, like a lot of people did, because of Cannonball. And then I got into, like, the other singles, like Divine Hammer and stuff like that. So I didn't... I had heard this record before we reviewed it, but I hadn't really spent much time with it. And I like its moodiness. I like that it isn't driven by Kim Deal's big hooks. And it's driven by much more i want to say atmospheric because that it's not an atmospheric record in the sense that it's like spacey or anything but there's space in the playing and there's sections where they will just ride a particular progression or there will be uh, an eeriness to some of the songs i'm thinking of like uh what is it track four i think that has the violin Mm -hmm. sort of sounds like this weird twisted country song I like that. I mean, I like how much of this record, like how it opens with glorious, this sort of very deliberate and slow pace. It really is an interesting listen from that respect that there's so much to just sort of digest in terms of all the playing that's going on. It's very tasteful, but you, like you said, it's so well balanced. You can hear everything. So you can really just like, close your eyes and just focus in and imagine you're in the room and you know hearing everything that's going on i like that experience of just like zoning out and listening to the record as a whole all the way through yeah only in threes has that really strange juxtaposition between a a baseline that almost sounds like a traditional like country western song if you just broke it broke Mm -hmm. it down but then there's this weird distant guitar part that makes it just go in this whole other place like otherworldly um and and it really really kind of matches the the vocal um in terms of like its presence and where it sits in the space in the mix you know the mixing of this record is is really phenomenal in terms of uh the vocals are often you know you know they're they're sometimes a little delicate and soft when they get aggressive it's it's like not overly like loud Mm -hmm. but the drum but the thing that i found interesting is the drums are always pretty loud like he's always playing fairly hard yeah um and even though some of these songs are very slow and really overall fairly quiet um usually a drummer in that situation would you know pull back and use brushes or do something a little bit more subtle but he doesn't which is really cool because you just end up with this very different kind of dynamic where, you know, he's playing fairly loud. Like happiness is a warm gun. Yeah, I was just gonna simple, mention that. Yeah, right. Um, which is a, I, I had never heard. I mean, I love the Beatles song, and it's one of those Beatles songs that's kind of for the, uh, you know, it, it gives them the, the magic of credibility, and that it's really weird. And, you know, it's from the White Album, which has some weird stuff on it, and mm-hmm. it's a complicated little song that. Um, I was never aware that they covered. Um, so it's a, it's a brilliant cover. And I think the, the use in the, dr- of the drums in that is really, um, unexpected in that how, you know, they're pretty, pretty hard hitting. Yeah. Um, but yet the song has all this space and quiet to it. And it's just, uh, 
very different kind of uh, approach. And to pull that off from a mixing standpoint is very difficult because nothing get, ever gets lost, even though the volumes are all and the dynamics of how everybody's uh, you know performing are so different. You would think that the vocal would get lost or the bass would get lost or, you know what I mean? But, or the drums would be obnoxious because he's playing, you know, fairly hard, but that never happens. It's, it's a pretty brilliant, uh, mix overall. Um, you know what it reminds me of? Sound of the record. It reminds me of the failure song, another space song, which has that like big, heavy drum part that Kelly Scott does. Mm -hmm. It's, it's much more elaborate, but then when the guitars come in, they're just these like delicate picking part, you know, like with a little bit of delay and yeah. spaciness. Yep. Yep. And it reminded me of like of that approach where the drums are like the most aggressive and loud part of the song. And it really drives the attitude of the song. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a really interesting choice to, to do it like that. And I totally agree with you that that's, those are really a highlight of this record, which made me like want to go back and re-listen to Slint because I don't remember loving the Slint record, and I'm like, maybe I didn't listen to that cr like close enough. Yeah. I need to listen to those drums again. Yeah, I mean, I think you just hit something there that is worth repeating. the The drums are the attitude of the record. It's not the guitars. It's not the vocal, which is unusual. In, in that, it, it, it's the to me, the drums are the edgy part. You know, um, he's not doing anything crazy. Right. You know, he's not playing like weird time signatures or pattern counter patterns or polyrhythms or anything. It's just the, I don't know, like the brunt force of them sometimes, um, yep. with in the contrast of some, uh, often a delicate or atmospheric, you know, guitar part or vocal. Um, and, and how the bass locks up with the drums is, is also pretty important. You know, the bass on this record is very, um, unconventional um in that it, it uh supports the vocal melody quite a bit but it also play off the drums in ways that aren't expected you know kind of play i noticed in a couple songs where it locks up with the drums but not playing a low part kind of playing a high part almost like a guitar would play and playing chords sometimes so yeah, yeah the bass is really integral to what's going on um and, and pulling you from the vocal to the drums back to the vocal back to the drums and then the guitars are creating all the tension. Chime on. So I mentioned when I, the thing that I liked about this record is also the thing that I, I don't like. The thing that I have a problem with this record is when you start dissecting it, the best, I would say, song in terms of a memorable vocal hook to me is the cover of the Beatles song, which is a problem because what is the record then without that cover and... Knowing what I know about Kim Deal from her time in the Pixies before this and her time with the Breeders afterwards, is that she's fully capable of writing, and so is Tanya Donnelly. Tanya Donnelly's written some amazing hooks. And, in, and what I found out is that the first Belly record, which comes out after this, a lot of those songs, like Feed the Tree, were written to be on the second Breeders record, but she decided to leave the band and go do her own thing. Clearly, between the two of them, they're capable of writing, like, really hooky, catchy indie rock songs. But I didn't find myself, like, able to lock in with any particular chorus or any particular vocal on... Except for, like, you know, like, Hellbound gets repeated in that chorus yeah. of that song. Yeah. I don't know if you had that same problem, but I just... I didn't... I found this to be a really relaxing, sort of cool listen, but did not stand up for me when I was breaking it down song by song. Oh, uh, yes. The the hooks are 
subtle, sometimes fleeting. Um, I think the melodies are in there. They just don't seem to focus on them. Uh, you know, these songs are very short too. So yep. I think the pieces and parts would be there if they wanted to take that direction with this stuff. I, I got the sense that that wasn't the idea maybe, or with the way they recorded it uh, quickly, they didn't, you know, painstakingly craft pop songs, which they probably, I guess, could have. Right. If they wanted to based on the history and and I think there's seeds here uh, of material for material that could go in that direction. I, I kind of perceived it as a different kind of record, a little bit more experimental and yeah, kind of more of a head listen like you know, it's a good headphone record. Like you said, you can put it on and be doing something else and it's still compelling like it, you don't forget that it's on, you know, you kind of get pulled into parts here and there. Um, it, it gives more the more you listen to it. You know, I think there's a lot of little like subtle vocal parts and spoken little pieces and bits and yeah, other vocals. I love the violins that pop into the record. I think the sequencing is pretty strong. You know, uh, you've got these these two violin songs uh, are, are parts that that pop in towards the front of the record, and then the middle you've got fortunately gone, which is. It's like a, probably the closest to a pop song on the that right they, that they have here, uh, and I think you know by only three only in threes it gets a little bit more experimental. Um, towards the end of the record, uh, but I think and so I think the sequencing is strong, but yeah, I'm with you. It's not like if you're expecting the hooks from the Pixies, um, and that kind of sensibility, it, it's not that. It's it's to me a little bit more experimental and right. It's kind of more of a band, exploration of a you know a, a new kind of band concept. Yeah, it's definitely more moody. I I just I think I got a little bit of not fatigue, but just like there was definitely a a, a slowness to this record that I wasn't that I didn't remember listening to it way back when. Whenever I did, yeah. um, that almost becomes a little plotting. Um, yeah at times so i think i was just like waiting for like one breakout original song but it's weird because i really enjoyed just kind of like listening to it on repeat you know it's only 30 minutes long so i would just like put it on repeat and it would just go over and over and over again i could listen like five times in a row and be working and not really like nothing really like jumped out at me like as a vocal that that was the only like weird thing yep i only knew where i was Especially because i would hear happiness Tan- is a warm gun and i'd be like Especially oh with tanya donnelly on the record you would expect you'd have some yeah you know pretty um um you know very strong vocal sections and there's nothing wrong with the vocals they're just like i said like i started with to me it's they're balanced like right she or Kim Deal never take over the song with the vocal. So it, it's always just dropped in as part of the overall mix. Um, and and it, it's, it, I guess it's more of the, the sum of its parts than, than maybe some other records or maybe what we would expect um, as opposed to, you know, really having one or two shining stars on it. And now this, this album does have a pretty strong legacy. This was when Kurt Cobain passed away and they published his journals. He listed this as like one of his favorite records. And along I could, with I could hear that. Yeah, along with sure. Surfer, Surfer Rosa. And this was listed amongst like Pitchfork's best you know, it was number eighty one and the best albums of the nineties and it was in it was number four sixty three of Enemies five hundred greatest albums of all time. And the Guardians thousand albums you have to hear before you die yeah okay wow but i, I could know, definitely hear some other bands that f- i could hear some some of the middle to later stage pearl jam stuff like some of the guitar riffs and things that are on this record where maybe some of those ideas came from mm-hmm. you can definitely hear some nirvana you know things that maybe they took from here oh the drum like, sounds even like yeah. if you think about what the way the drums sound on Never mind, and in utero, in utero, mm-hmm. like you could trace that back to this record, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Like big, but not reverby, you know, clean. 
Um, yeah, I mean, you can hear how this would be a launching point for a lot of people who are really into the sounds of this record. Um, Mm -hmm. but as far as it being like a commercial record, I just, I don't know where you would get, there's like, there's no no singles necessarily. No, No. Um, but I don't think it has to function in that way. Yeah. So, but it's weird because the next record is in comparison so poppy well poppy is relative because last splash is a really weird song Mm -hmm. it just happens to have a lot of energy to it and you know works as a single in whatever 1993 or when 92 when that came out it's just a weird comparison to uh Mm -hmm. to make so jay Yes. Were the album better EP or decent single? Well, I feel like after hearing all that love, I want to be contrarian and say it's an EP, but I think it's worthy album. I, I was pleasantly surprised. I think it's it's one of those two. I think if you're a musician, there's a lot here to really dig into and take inspiration from. So I appreciate it from that standpoint too. Uh, just in terms of the from the guitar playing standpoint, to go back to my original point, the just the restraint in the the idea behind how the guitars are used here is it's it's inspirational it's something to consider you know as a guitar player that you don't have to like play loud over everything to make an impact so i i uh to, to go back to the rating i'm at an album um i don't think everything on here is amazing i don't think like hellbound is the greatest song i've ever heard um i'm not sure that you know i'm a big fan of iris or opened i think they're okay but they're not like Mind blowing, but I think right. there is a majority of material on here that is really uh, creative and distinct and really well recorded and performed. Um, so, you know, I'm at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven songs that I like a lot. And there's something on here that's not listenable. I think Metal Man is probably the most um, unfinished yeah. um, song on the record. But uh, at 30 minutes, I mean, my goodness, it's a quick listen. I think there's a lot of really cool ideas on here, and it's an important part of the 90s. So for me, it's a worthy record. Here's what I wish. I wish that Happiness is a Warm Gun was either not on the record or was a hidden track at the end because I feel like it it provides this temporary weird escape from the album because, A, you know the song. Yeah. And it's far more melodic than anything else yeah and it it almost needs to be like not a part of it officially like yeah and i think i'd actually like the album a lot better i mean i like the record as a like you said like just listening through and how good it sounds and how well everything works together it's a great cover i mean I, I, yeah I love, oh yeah it's I a great cover. A cover but it, i can i can get the it it does um i mean god anytime you put a Beatles song on your record i mean geez oh man it's right <laughs> I, you gotta you gotta really step back and say is this the best decision you know Beatles Led Zeppelin you know the Who <laughs> if you're putting one of those band songs on your record I, it's gonna be tough for that to not uh, yeah, cast a shadow on the rest of what you're doing I mean so I, I, I see where you're coming from on that I believe that that was added because the guy from 4AD Ivo Watts, Watts Russell suggested it. Now yeah. he's famous because, or, or he's infamous because he did a series of albums called This Mortal Coil, which were just artists doing covers, but in like, you know, you take a big star song, which is like this big poppy, you know, power pop song, but you do it as like a torch ballad. So he would he would find artists that w- performed in a certain way, and he would give them a song that was sort of like antithetical to what they sound like and say try doing this so he would he was often like finding songs and saying i think this would work for your band so he was the one who suggested doing that i also wonder if he if he thought like there's not really a single and i need a single (laughs) so maybe if i suggest this record it'll at least get some airplay because it's a cool beatles song yeah um i don't know what the you know his thought process it was in in suggesting it but those might have been in his mind. Um, yep. I think it's, it's a worthy record just to put it on, listen through. If you're a, if you're a breeders fan and you only know last splash, 
it might be a little jarring because it's so moody, because it's so intimate in a lot of ways, and it doesn't sound like what you expect from them. Or if you're only familiar with like the Pixies, which are, you know, for as weird as that band could be, very melody driven, very hook driven band. Yeah. So, and this record is like the opposite of that in a lot of ways. So, in the, I mean, in that respect, it's worthy just to listen to it and, and just get a whole different side of, you know, Kim Deal and, and Tanya Donnelly, who we associate with, you know, much more popular uh, singles. So, yeah, it's a worthy record. Who was it that suggested the album, Jay? Brian Zillow. Brian, thank you for suggesting this record. And if you want to suggest a record and you're a listener, you don't have to be a patron. All you have to do is go to digmeoutpodcast.com and go to the suggestion area on the website. Drop your uh, suggestion in there. Give us some uh, reasons why, and maybe it'll make it into one of our polls, and maybe it'll win. Who knows? Did you check out the, uh, the poll we got going on right now? So as of recording... We've got some we got some heavy hitters in this one. That's a heavy hitter poll. Yes. We got Supergrass in here. Um we've got Blind Melon. But right now, overwhelming color fast is winning that poll. So we'll see. Uh by the time you guys hear this, you'll probably know who won. But uh I find that interesting. Primal Scream. Yeah. I Mother Earth, Fishbone. These are all names, Jay. Names. <laughs> I've heard that name overwhelming color fast, but I have no idea what they sound like. Yeah. So Me neither. I'm cu- I'm curious to see what happens there. And we got we got a little uh, shade about you know supergrass even being on here that maybe it's too popular to be in a poll. I would disagree with that. I don't think most people know who supergrass is, but uh, no. I mean, even though they're a Britpop band, they are not in the same level as Blur or Oasis, right? Or even Pulp, for that matter. Yeah. Especially in the United States. That that band did not make a dent no. in the US the way that those bands did. So But uh regardless right now it is not uh, it's not in the lead. We'll see. Maybe it pulls it out in the end here and we'll we'll end up doing that record. I like it, so I'm not gonna complain. But uh it's always fun to watch how this plays Actually, out. Actually, Jay, Blind Melon's soup is pulled ahead. Oh. Well that kinda I, that may have gotten the most comments we've ever seen on Facebook. That was uh Yeah. And uh that may have been recommend. That may have been requested more than once. Now, I think it might be coming up again if it doesn't make it. <laughs> so if it makes it, we pull it from the future poll, right? We don't uh, do it twice. Well, yes, yes. But uh, if it doesn't win, I'm just going to leave it in there, so it can be voted on again if somebody wants to nominate it. Nice. All right. If you like what you heard, folks, please consider leaving us some positive feedback over at iTunes. And for Jay, I'm Tim. We're out. We'll be back next week with another episode of Dig Me Out. Thanks for listening. To support the podcast, visit www.patreon.com forward slash dig me out and become a monthly subscriber at www.digmeoutpodcast.com where you can find links to our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram pages, as well as our merchandise store at zazzle.com. Ein stürzender Neubauten. Ja.